Come on. Wow. Come on, you're going to make me cry. It's, uh, it's, it's really a, a tremendous honor to be with all of you. I, I, I've recognized so many faces. Uh, I was just talking to Tom, who is a 30-year veteran, who is now a vet for peace, who was one of the strong voices that we had when we were trying to stop Blackwater from opening up shop first in Potrero, uh, and then when they tried to, to, to turn that strip mall into a little paramilitary camp here in San Diego, and uh, so many other people that, that worked tirelessly, and, and you know, Ray Lutz, who was just an amazing campaigner to try to shut down Blackwater's presence here in California, and Carol, and Miranda, and all of the folks who are working uh, with the San Diego Peace Center. Uh, it's just really great to see all of you here. When I saw, I saw the dro drone when I walked in, I haven't seen this sort of, they don't look like that when you see them in a, in a war zone. They're sort of ominous and they're high up in the sky and you hear sort of this sort of hum that almost sounds like a, like a lawnmower or something. So it's, uh, I have to say it was a little bit creepy for me and it's a, very creepy to see myself in the crosshairs there. So I don't know, I don't know if we can turn that off or something. <laughs> Um, oh, I thought she was coming up to turn it off. Darn. I, I want to tell folks, we, um, we, I've been um, traveling um, in and out of various U.S. war zones, declared and undeclared, uh, pr pretty much for the past 12 or 13 years. I guess most of my adult life I've spent going in and out of war zones, and I cut my teeth as a, uh, thank you, well, now you have the audience in the crosshair, so I don't know, maybe I should take one for the team. Uh, you know, I, I started off, uh, um, I, my, my parents are both uh, nurses and we never took a trip out of the country at all when I was a kid. Our vacation in the summers would be we'd go once to like the Six Flags theme park and another to a water park and we thought we had it made and we never went anywhere outside of the country and uh, one of the first trips I, I took internationally was actually to Iraq. Um, which is, uh, and I, I did that when I was working with um, Amy Goodman at Democracy Now. Some uh, friends of my father's were uh, going into Iraq at the time. There was an economic war uh, being waged against Iraq, and this was a, during the Clinton administration, where you had this incredibly brutal regime of uh, economic sanctions that were strengthening the regime of Saddam Hussein and, and harming uh, Iraqi civilians. And, and people forget that. Clinton initiated the longest sustained bombing campaign since Vietnam under the guise of the so-called no-fly zones in the north and south of Iraq. And so I, I, I went into uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq with a humanitarian delegation that was trying to break the economic sanctions. And they weren't shipping huge amounts of goods. They were bringing in symbolic, uh, symbolic items that would uh, dramatize how outrageous the sanctions were. Basic goods like aspirin or other analgesics. Uh, lead pencils were not allowed. Bleach was not allowed because they classified it as dual use. And uh, and I'll I'll never forget uh, how profound and uh, and and profoundly moving the first trip I took to Iraq was because I I had never really done any real reporting. In fact, I don't have a degree, a college degree at all. I didn't. I've never taken a journalism class. I begged my way into a a job with Amy Goodman at Democracy Now. I, I think Amy had to decide at one point, I was calling her and saying, you know, if you have a cat, I'll feed your cat. If you have windows, I'll wash your windows. You know, I had heard her on the radio, I said, I want to be her. And, uh, and I was started to basically to stalk her. And she, um, she had to decide whether to get a restraining order against me or to let me come in and volunteer on her show. So I go from then being a coffee runner with Amy to somehow scrounging up enough money from begging people, relatives and others for cash to go to Iraq. And I end up in Iraq. and. Uh, I, I knew very little about U.S. policy there, and I'll never forget being in a hospital in the south of Iraq in Basra and seeing the birth defects that children were suffering from as a result of the depleted uranium munitions that the U.S. used in the 1991 Gulf War, and, and seeing uh, so many women who were pregnant fearing that their children were going to be born with these horrifying birth defects, and I'll never forget the the, the moment when I was in the delivery room when a, a, a child was born and, uh, and had this gaping hole from his nose to his uh, throat. And, and the doctor said to us, and these were American-trained, British-trained doctors, Iraq was a very modern society prior to the 91 Gulf War, and they said, you know, we are, we're finding birth defects that don't even exist in medical journals. And, uh, and, and I, I knew when I was there that one of the primary 
things that I wanted to do with my life, one of the primary missions or I wanted to set for myself was to uh, put a microphone in front of the, uh, the mouths of people who would have no voice if journalists from the United States didn't go there and, and talk to them and make their stories heard. And I've, I've tried over the years to uh, be a reporter in that spirit, an unembedded journalist who goes and, and embeds with the civilians who live on the other side of the barrel of the gun, so to speak. And I, I, I most recently, the past few years, spent a lot of time in uh, Yemen and Somalia and in Afghanistan. I also was elsewhere in East Africa, uh, exploring the landscape of uh, U.S. wars declared and undeclared. And in Afghanistan, there are two wars. There's the conventional war that we see with the Marines and embedded journalists, and then there's another war buried within it, which is a special operations uh, war of attrition, where you have night raids and hit lists and people being hunted down, and they've killed so far down the kill list over the past decade plus that they're now targeting farmers in valleys who are only fighting the U.S. because we're there. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's gotten to a point where I don't think that most U.S. military personnel in Afghanistan even understand who the enemy is, in, is anymore. And we, we, in the course of, of reporting on these stories, I traveled with, uh, with my dear friend Richard Rowley, who is a great independent journalist, and he's an unfamous journalist, but he, uh, he's this fantastic cameraman and a very brave guy, and, and, and we were filming together for three plus years, and we made a film by the same name called Dirty Wars that premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. And Rick actually won the Cinematography Prize, which is interesting because it's a prize for the art of a film. And if you see it, it really is, is remarkable how talented he is. Um, but I found out today that it's, uh, it's actually going to have a theatrical run in San Diego. Um, I, I think it's going to open June 21st or 28th at the Landmark Theater. They haven't decided on the exact date, but it opens around the country starting June 7th. And it's, I think we're up to about 50 cities. So you can spread the word and tell your friends. Um, I wanted to, to start off by, uh, by telling you a story about an incident that happened on December 17th, 2009. Uh, this was just you know, a little bit less than a year into uh, the Obama presidency. And President Obama had campaigned. I think many people had the perception that he was the anti-war candidate. But if you actually paid attention to his platform and you looked at who he chose as his advisors around him, particularly on national security and counterterrorism issues, he was charting out or staking out a fairly hawkish foreign policy position. He pledged to surge in Afghanistan. He said he was going to take the fight to al-Qaeda. And he, in, in, in a, a, one of the sharpest exchanges with John McCain, said that he would actually violate the sovereignty of nations if, he, if we had, and the specific example he gave was if we know where Osama bin Laden is, he said we would go into Pakistan with or without the support of the Pakistani government. Uh, he also pledged to close Guantanamo, which of course still remains one of the great stains on the fabric of our democratic republic. The fact that there are hunger strikers there now, the fact that hundreds of thousands of people are now signing on to these petitions. I think we have a moment where we actually can push hard on that issue because it should have been closed long ago. And it's not just uh, because the Republicans have blocked it in Congress, though that is part of it. It's also because the Obama administration hasn't fought hard enough on this issue, haven't made it enough of a priority. When Democrats were threatening to dissent early on in the Obama presidency from his defense authorization, and, and, and people like Dennis Kucinich and Jan Schakowsky and others began to dissent. Uh, many of them were pressured by the White House. Freshman Congress people were threatened with the president not campaigning for their reelection if they didn't flip and vote in favor of these defense bills. If, the, if, 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 if Obama showed that same kind of resolve on the Guantanamo issue and actually made the stakes that high for people in his own party in particular, I believe that they would have shut down Guantanamo. So for the first 10, 11 months of the Obama presidency, I think it was pretty clear what direction we were headed in. He issued executive orders saying he was going to dismantle the black sites, these CIA prisons that had been set up in Thailand and Poland and elsewhere around the world. He said he was going to close Guantanamo, and he said he was going to bring an end to torture. And that all played out in public. But behind the scenes, President Obama was listening to some very powerful figures from the covert apparatus that permeates the shadows of America's foreign policy. And, and that were, that were, those were people like General Stanley McChrystal and Admiral William McRaven, 
General McChrystal ran the Joint Special Operations Command from 2003 to 2008 and was essentially running a global hit team that did not function within the normal chain of command of the military, often reported directly back to Vice President Dick Cheney, and they were doing things far outside of the lens or scope of congressional oversight or any effective congressional oversight. And Admiral William McRaven, who was McChrystal's deputy, was a man who very early on after 9-11 helped the National Security Council to develop the concept of a kill list. He would then go on to run the hunt for the people on that list under the Obama presidency. And so these individuals, General McChrystal, Admiral McRaven, and others, began agitating for President Obama to expand the battlefield. They wanted to take a military doctrine, which is known as operational preparation of the battle space which essentially dictates that if the U.S. military determines that there are future hostility possibilities in a nation, that you can forward deploy troops and you can begin to prepare the way for a full-on onslaught of the U.S. military. Well, that military doctrine was repeatedly used through the Bush era to justify acting in countries without the knowledge of, co of Congress and without any sort of declaration of war. And, and early on in his presidency, Obama started to issue execute orders that gave permission to U.S. Special Operations Forces to begin striking in countries outside of Iraq and Afghanistan and to intensify its operations, particularly in the Horn of Africa and on the Arabian Peninsula. And on this particular day, December 17, 2009, President Obama was presented with a series of baseball cards that had the identities of individuals on them and sort of their stats, like you would have stats for a pitcher or, you know, or a, a, a cleanup hitter. And, and, and the, uh, the individuals that were on that card, the president were told, were dangerous leaders of Al-Qaeda and they needed to be taken out and that all of them were residing in Yemen. And that one of them had actually been tracked to this village called al Majla, which is in Abiyan province. I don't think anyone in the White House had ever heard of al Majla. Most Yemenis had never heard of al Majla. And they told the president that they had this solid information that a man named Mohammed al Qazmi was there, that he was a, a dyed in the wool jihadist, and that he was a leader of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. They also told the president that there was an Al Qaeda training camp there and that they had huge stores for ammunition and rockets and other weapons. And based on that intelligence, the president and his advisors signed off on a strike against Al Majla. And they wanted to use drones. And remember that already the president was intensifying the drone war in Pakistan. On, the, on his third day in office, he ordered his first drone strike, and it ended up uh, hitting a civilian procession. And the person that they claimed was there wasn't there. So that was on day three of the presidency. Drone bomb every three days for that first year in Pakistan. He wanted to use a drone to do this strike against Al Majla because the firepower in the drones is not as potent as some of the other military platforms. But they couldn't. Uh, find any drones that were available because they were all being used to bomb Pakistan. And so they authorized a cruise missile strike from a submarine that was in the ocean just off of the coast of Yemen. And a Tomahawk cruise missile is an utterly devastating weapon. I've, I've seen the effect of it, the impact of it when it's on the ground, but they also were using cluster bombs, which are like flying landmines. The first time I saw the impact of a cluster bomb was in 1999 in Yugoslavia when a marketplace in the city of Nish was bombed. And I went there a few hours after it. And I remember as we started to drive up to that marketplace, I, I was shocked at how, uh, how the shrapnel was so sharp and moving at such a fierce velocity that it had actually made, it had fossilized the impact of a bomb in the cement. It looked like splashed water, except it was indented in the cement. And then when we got to the marketplace in Nish, we saw what I can only describe as shredded meat. Uh, and it had been, they had been people that had been there. And, and, and I, as if I recall correctly, that marketplace was bombed not long after noon when people were going out to buy greens or what have you. And so this was the platform that they chose to bomb this, what they said was an Al-Qaeda training camp. And, and you know, cluster bombs come down and they, they detonate in the air and they spread shrapnel over a multi-football field radius. And it is, utterly horrifying what it does when it hits animals or human beings. And the strike happens, and they all believe in the White House that what they've done is taken out an Al-Qaeda training camp. And, what, and the next day, the Yemeni embassy in Washington, D.C. issues a press release. And they say that they've, they have conducted air raids on this terrorist camp in Al-Majla with Yemeni aircraft, and that they had taken out 
the terrorist training camp. And then the White House sent congratulations to the Yemeni government on this victory against Al Qaeda. And, and, and no one would have been the wiser that it was not a Yemeni strike, and it was, in fact, a U.S. cruise missile strike, if a brave young Yemeni journalist named Abdullah Haider Shaya hadn't traveled to Al Majla in the aftermath of that strike. And he traveled there because he had received phone calls from tribal leaders in the area that were describing seeing the markings made in the USA on the missile parts. And, and they wanted him to come and, and, and videotape it. And no one had seen any airplanes fly overhead, just missiles slamming in. And the missiles hit a little bit after 6 a.m. Most of the people were sleeping in this village. And so this journalist, Abdullah Haider Shaya, goes to Al Majla. And he takes photographs and video of the aftermath of this bombing. And he, he sent those photographs to various news agencies around the world. And he also provided them to Amnesty International. And Amnesty International had a munitions expert look at the pictures that Abdul El Haider Shaya had given them. And they determined beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were, in fact, cruise missiles and cluster bombs. And the Amnesty International noted that cluster bombs are illegal under international weapons conventions. And so he started reporting on this story. And he went on Al Jazeera. And he said that the Americans were the ones that bombed Al Majla, and that among the dead were 14 women and 21 children. And he had photos of dead children, of babies being pulled out of rubble, uh, of the body parts of women, of little girls who part of their body was here and part was there. And he had evidence of it, and he started speaking to not only Al Jazeera, but other international news outlets. And then the story started to come out in the press, because remember, the U.S., the last time the U.S. bombed Yemen was in 2002, and it was a one-time thing authorized by Bush. It was a drone strike in 2002. But there was no declared war in Yemen, and it came completely out of the blue. And so it was at that moment that we knew that the United States was initiating a bombing campaign against Yemen. And soon after Abdul El Haider Shaya blew the whistle on the cruise missile attack at Al Majla, he was abducted off the streets as he was going into the market with a friend of his who was a political cartoonist, and both of them were snatched by the U.S.-backed counterterrorism force in Yemen. These are Yemenis that are trained and funded by the U.S. And he was taken to a political prison and savagely beaten in that prison, beaten bloody. And they told him, you are to shut your mouth about Al Majla or we're going to put you back in this prison and they release him onto the streets, and he goes immediately to the studios of Al Jazeera, and he says, I was just abducted by the U.S.-backed counterterrorism unit, and they are threatening me that if I don't stop talking about Al Majla, that they're going to put me back into that prison. So while this journalist is continuing to report the story, General David Petraeus, who at the time was the commander of CENTCOM, U.S. Central Command, arrives in Sana'a for meetings with the country's leadership. And we know about these meetings because of Bradley Manning leaking the cables to WikiLeaks and then those being published around the world. And in this meeting with General Petraeus and the U.S.-backed dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh and the Deputy Prime Minister Rashid Alimi in Yemen, the, the, according to the cable, the Deputy Prime Minister of Yemen tells Petraeus, I just lied to my parliament and told them that it was us doing the bombing. And they said, you know, we'll continue to lie for you and say the bombs are ours and not yours. And they were conspiring to initiate a bombing campaign where Yemen would take responsibility for the strikes, but the United States would be conducting the strikes. And soon after this began to be exposed to the world, Abdul El Haider Shaya was arrested once again, was disappeared for 30 days, was held in the political security organization's prison, and then he was hauled into court in a cage. And he had his, the lawyers that showed up that day from the equivalent of the ACLU said that they would refuse to present a defense in his case because it's not a legitimate tribunal. He was being prosecuted in a court that had been set up specifically to try journalists who had committed crimes against the U.S.-backed dictatorship, thought crimes against them. Cartoonists would be in there for uh, drawing uh, political cartoons that were offensive to the regime. Writers who had interviewed someone from al-Qaeda could find themselves in there. And so Abdul El Haider Shaya is hauled into court. One of his teeth is broken. The other, another one had been pulled out. He had scars on his chest. And he appears in this cage and he addresses, there were some journalists in the room and there were some lawyers and his family were there. And he said, this is what happens when a journalist tells the truth in Yemen. When you expose 
the American cruise missile bombing of the tiny Bedouin village of Al Majula, this is what they do to you, and then they pull him away, and we have the video of, of that, and they pull him away. And there was so much outcry in Yemen over the imprisonment of Abdul al Haider Shaya and the ultimate conviction of Abdul al Haider Shaya for terrorism. He was sentenced to five years in prison for being an Al-Qaeda facilitator. Every major media rights and human rights organization in the world condemned his trial as a sham, and they said that he should be released. The government had fabricated evidence against him, and they didn't call a single witness. And so he's sentenced to five years in prison for being an Al-Qaeda facilitator. And while he's in prison, posters started to appear around Sana'a, the capital of Yemen, with his picture on it, demanding his return, demanding his release. And his tribe and other tribes began to put pressure on the Yemeni government. And they said, we want Abdul Ella Haider Shia freed. You can't keep him in there on these trumped up charges. And the pressure was so intense from human rights groups, international and domestic and tribal leaders in Yemen, that the US-backed dictator decides that he's going to pardon Abdul Ella Haider Shia. And he's preparing a document that's going to grant him a sort of amnesty. And it leaks in the Saba news agency, Yemen's official news agency, that, that the dictator of Yemen is going to do this. And that day, he receives a phone call. The president of Yemen receives a phone call from the White House, not from uh, some flacky, not from uh, you know, the White House spokesperson or some deputy secretary of who knows what, but from President Obama himself. And President Obama says to Ali Abdullah Saleh, that the United States has serious concerns about word that you're going to release Abdul Ella Haider Shaya, and the pardon was ripped up. And he remains in prison to this day. He remains in prison to this day. And I just got an email from his brother the other day, and he told me that his cell regularly gets tossed by uh, operatives of the political security organization, that they take his things away from him. Anytime someone brings him something, they snatch it away. After he's gotten used to having a new book, they take it away. And his brother said he's starting to lose his mind. He's starting to talk to himself. This was a guy who was a heroic journalist. And he did work not just for Al Jazeera, he did work for the Washington Post. He did work for ABC News. When I first reported on his story, there hadn't been any articles done about it. And I started to understand this was a guy who had interviewed leaders of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and his interviews were published on the front pages of major US newspapers as scoops. And I couldn't understand why none of those newspapers or why ABC News never said, free Abdullah Haider Shia, free our colleague. Because when they wanted the scoop on an Al Qaeda exclusive interview with an Al Qaeda leader, they were more than happy to recognize that he was a journalist. But when he's in prison, they say nothing. And so I asked a very famous journalist from one of those news organizations, why are you silent about the imprisonment of Abdullah Haider Shia? And a few days later, he got back to me and he said, we were told by the US government that the money we were paying him was being used as fundraising for Al Qaeda, which is an outrageous false allegation. I'm sure they were paying him pennies to, to do the risky work that he was doing. But the US government is smearing him to these organizations and saying he's a terrorist. His work is well known by anyone who covers Yemen and anyone who knows the politics of Yemen because he's one of the few real journalists in a society dominated by regime sycophants. He was one of the only people that re reported critically about Al-Qaeda after having met them in, in, face to face. He was a courageous young man, and he's in prison to this day for actually being a journalist. And he's in prison on orders of the most powerful man in the world. Our Constitution law professor, Nobel Peace Prize president is keeping a journalist in prison in a gulag in Yemen because he had the audacity to blow the whistle on a bombing that they tried to cover up that killed 14 women and 21 children. The, the very, very last line of my book at the very end of my acknowledgments says that Abdul, as of this writing, Abdullah Haider Shaya is still in prison and he should be set free and he should be set free. Global Voices for Justice is a nonprofit media organization. Our mission is to bring to you independent thinkers and analysts who enhance our understanding of the world we live in. Your financial support enables us to achieve our mission. With a minimum $12 contribution, you will receive a copy of this talk. 
Thank you. 